Now, even if you're not that big of a math person, you may have heard of something called a Fourier transform. The general definition that most people have heard before is that Fourier transforms basically let you split up a wave, which is a sum of a bunch of other simpler waves with different frequencies, into those frequencies, allowing you to, for example, analyze or manipulate audio or electrical signals. But the Fourier transform itself is really just the most well-known form of something called an integral transform. Now, the Fourier transform is pretty intuitive on its own. You convert a wave into a sum of simpler waves with singular frequencies. But integral transforms are a really broad field, and many of the other ones have much less physical interpretations. And one of those is the Laplace transform. Now, if you've ever taken a differential equations course before, you've probably encountered it. The vast majority of the time, it's just used as a tool in solving certain types of differential equations, and it's usually just not worth it to dive very deeply into what the thing actually is or what it actually does to functions. And put simply, the Laplace transform is an integral transform which can simplify certain equations by transforming them into polynomials, which you can just solve and rearrange like an algebraic equation. But there's a lot more under the surface. Now, normally if you wanted to really intuitively understand something, you might want to go and start at the discovery of that thing. But the truth of the Laplace transform is that it really was developed specifically to solve differential equations and probability theory. There really is no deeper geometrical thing that its inventors actually wanted to create. But as we'll see, there is still some really cool geometrical understanding that you can pull out of the Laplace transform. And you'll see a really surprising connection between some things that would make it just such an obvious choice for the type of problem you'd want to solve. To start off with, though, we need to look a little bit into integral transforms as a whole. Integral transforms formally are mathematical objects that essentially cause a change of variables in an input function using an integral. Now, this definition is really broad and doesn't really tell you very much about what you can actually do with them, so we're going to take a look at the Fourier transform first to get a sense of what these are actually doing and why there's an integral in there in the first place. Now before we start with that, I'm going to go over what integrals actually are and what they do. Integrals take in three arguments, a function, a variable to integrate with respect to, and your limits. An integral essentially performs an average of the value of your input function over the range specified by your limits with respect to your variable. And it's important to note that it also multiplies said average by the size of your limits of integration. So. If I had my function being f of x equals x integrated with respect to x from 0 to 5, I would end up with 12.5 because the average value would be right in the middle, being 2.5 multiplied by 5 to give 12.5. Now the thing that really sets integrals apart from a simple average is that it works continuously, meaning that it'll find the average of a set of data points defined by a function, even if that set has an infinite size. Now, that being said, integrals do have a lot of other interpretations. Normally, when calculating an average, you sum up all of your values and divide by the total number of them. Then, of course, for an integral, we multiply by the size of the interval. Now, you can also think of this as summing up all of the values with each one multiplied by one over the number of values, and then again multiplied by the size of the interval. This is directly analogous to adding up the areas under the curve of the function, since it's essentially just base times height, with the base being that tiny step along the x-axis and the height being the value of the function. Now something you may notice is that by taking an integral of this function of x, our answer no longer depends on x. We've essentially eliminated a variable from it. So, if we were to also introduce a new variable here, we could essentially swap one variable out for another in some systematic way, which is the definition of an integral transform. But still, this doesn't tell us much about why we actually care about taking the integral of some function. So, let's take a look at the Fourier transform to get a sense of what's really going on. The Fourier transform is pretty intuitive on the surface. You give it a function which represents the amplitude of some wave at each point in time. And essentially, the transform will transform it from a time or space variable to a frequency variable. For instance, if I took a sound wave and plugged it in, it would be able to tell me exactly what percentage of the sound wave was at certain frequencies, allowing me to pick out certain sounds or even delete noise by manually moving the Fourier transformed function in the frequency range that I don't like and then just converting it back. Now, 3 bull one brown has a fantastic video on the Fourier transform, and I'm going to try and summarize the basic concept here, but watch his video if you want some more info, because he does a really good job of visualizing it. The Fourier transform essentially creates a simple oscillator, just a wave with a single frequency, and overlays it with the input function. 
the output of the Fourier transform is then the average of the products of both the input function and this oscillator over some interval. What this means is that the amplitude of the Fourier transform will be at its highest when the original function and the oscillator are moving in phase with the same frequency. In other words, if our input function has some component that has the same frequency as the one in the oscillator, we get a peak. So think of it like this. If I have two waves centered around zero, every so often they'll both return back to zero. If we then multiply these two waves pointwise, any instances where either wave is zero will end up nullifying the amplitude of the other one. So, if we want to maximize this average of products of amplitudes, we need to match up the zeros so that they don't really have anything else to destroy. Additionally, to maximize amplitude even further, you want both waves to be in phase, since that ensures that the amplitudes will have the same sign when multiplied, always giving a positive number to add to the average, instead of a negative which could push the average back up to zero. So this average of products will have peaks when our specified frequency and phase of the oscillator match a component of our function, and elsewhere it'll just be essentially flat. Now of course, this uses an average, so you can probably see where the integral itself is coming in. In integral form, it looks like this. All it does is compute the average of the product of the function with this thing, which is just a simple oscillator with frequency f, like we talked about before. When computed out into a function, it becomes a function of f and not x, since we averaged over the time axis. When a value for f is plugged in, it becomes the frequency of that simple oscillator, and thus is the frequency that you're probing for. Now, let's take a look at this oscillator really quick. The first question is, why are there imaginary numbers here? I mean, waves themselves are sines and cosines, and yeah, you actually could do it with sines and cosines, that would work. But the reason why we use this imaginary exponential form is because it actually captures the behavior of both sines and cosines, and kind of works as a sort of shorthand. Essentially, since this exponential captures the behavior of both functions, if you can translate your input function into the complex plane one-to-one, -one, it becomes a lot more convenient to work with. And then when you're done with the transform, you can just convert it back into real space using the inverse of whatever translation you used before. Now, that being said, we will need some knowledge of imaginary exponentials for later, so I'm first going to go over why you need both sines and cosines in the first place, and then we'll go over why imaginary exponentials actually capture the behavior of both of them. As we discussed earlier, the Fourier transform's value at some frequency will be dependent on how well the zeros line up with each other in the oscillator and the input function. This is indeed frequency dependent, but there is also a dependence on the phase as well. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. If I have a component of frequency 2 in my input function and an oscillator at frequency 2 that's out of phase with the input function, we're going to get a lot of negatives being added to this average, which is mostly positives, and things are going to start canceling out. In order for our transform to work, both waves need to have roughly the same sign all the time, or roughly the opposite sign all the time. Ultimately, the goal is to ensure that all of the values of the product are on the same side of zero, because if any are on the opposite, they fight one another through addition, and give us an average closer to zero. However, since sines and cosines are exactly 90 degrees out of phase, by using both, we end up capturing both extremes of the phase spectrum, and finding the frequency dependence pretty easily. They essentially cover both ends. Now, imaginary exponentials are where things get a little odd, but I promise it's not that bad. You can actually prove that e to the ix is equal to cosine of x plus i sine of x using calculus. Now, let's assume we don't know how to compute imaginary exponents at all. Exponentiation is multiplying a number by itself some amount of times, and imaginary numbers are not numerical quantities that we can translate into some number of times. So. We're just going to say that e to the ix is equal to a plus bi, where a and b are just arbitrary functions. This is just the model for some generic complex valued function of x. If we take the derivative of e to the ix with the chain rule, we end up with itself times the derivative of the exponent, which is just i. So, we know that a plus bi must also be multiplied by i when its derivative is taken, leading to minus b plus ai. Taking further derivatives, we end up with these four expressions, being minus a minus bi, b minus ia, and then at the fourth derivative, we return to a plus bi. So, if we can find two functions that obey these relationships, we can solve it. For starters, we know that as we take derivatives of a, it becomes minus b, then minus a, then b, and then back to a. And then for derivatives of b, it becomes a, then minus b, then minus a, then back to b, 
Now you may notice that the two functions that obey these relationships are actually cosine and sine for a and b respectively. The derivative of sine is cosine and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So these two functions can plug right in and work perfectly. So e to the ix is equal to cosine of x plus i sine of x, meaning that it encapsulates both sine and cosine at once, and therefore becomes a more succinct and easy to work with choice for the Fourier transform. On top of that, exponentials are also just a lot nicer to work with algebraically than sines and cosines. Now that we know a bit about the Fourier transform, I'm going to introduce the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform is extremely similar to the Fourier, but instead of e to the i f x, it uses e to the minus s x, where s is any arbitrary complex number. Now the immediate thought that probably comes to mind when you see this is that it probably tries to break down functions into their complex frequencies, but what even are those? We know that imaginary frequencies are essentially just circles in the complex plane, since that's what cosine and sine functions draw out in a 2D plane point-wise, but what would complex frequencies do? And as it turns out, it's actually easier than you would expect to figure out. Plugging in a plus bi for s in the exponent allows us to split it up into two different exponents. Essentially, a complex frequency just becomes an oscillator with the imaginary component times some real exponential term, meaning that this oscillator will either decay or grow based on the value of a. Now on the complex plane, if we start out with a single imaginary frequency circle, and start trying to decay that amplitude for every step forward in the angle, what we get is a spiral. So, does the Laplace transform tell you something about how much the input function is spiraling? And figuring this out is not quite as simple as you would think. Primarily because the Laplace transform is not just a real valued function that we can find a maximum for. It maps a field of complex numbers to another field of complex numbers. And Although we could find the value with the highest magnitude, if we treated the outputs as vectors, the magnitude is only one piece of the puzzle. It might work, but it would be a shot in the dark without some reasoning behind it. So, to figure out what the Laplace transform is actually measuring, we should probably look back at something similar to it, like the Fourier transform. If you remember back to the Fourier transform, we want to maximize the average value of the product of our oscillator and our input function. This can be done two ways, for one, matching the frequencies so that the zeros can only cancel themselves out, and also matching the phase so that the product result is always one sign. On the flip side, what we're actually doing here in the Laplace transform is finding the average of a product of two functions, one being a spiral and the other being an input function. However, instead of just a single product that we want to match the zeros and phases for, we now have two products, a real part and an imaginary part. Whenever components of this spiral hit zero, like when it's at some integer multiple of 90 degrees, the value of the product for that component will also be zero due to multiplication. So once again, it's in our best interest to ensure that the spiral-like components of the function have the same phase and frequency as the spiral oscillator. In order to minimize the loss created by multiplying zero by other things and being out of phase. And thus, we can maximize both components just as we would with a Fourier transform. Now, with the Laplace transform though, we can't just plot the output directly. Instead, if we want to maximize the absolute value of the averages of both components simultaneously by ensuring that the frequency we're currently targeting aligns with one that exists in our input function, we can just plot the magnitude or even the sum of the components, since the magnitude will ensure that both of the components are squared and thus will have an absolute value. So, to recap, the system we've built will take the Laplace transform of some input function and we'll plot the magnitude of the Laplace transform at each point in the complex plane. Due to the comparison to the Fourier transform, we should theoretically see it be mostly flat and have peaks wherever the input function has a component that is a frequency of one of these complex spirals. Whenever it does, both the real and imaginary component averages will be at an extreme. So, to test, let's just drop in a complex spiral, like e to the 1 plus 1i times t. These should show a peak of 1, 1, and sure enough, that is exactly what happens. Now, this is all well and good. We now know that the Laplace transform is essentially a complex despiralization transform. But the reason why nobody knows this or studies it is simply because nobody cares. I mean, if you had a differential equation whose solutions were spirals on the complex plane, then sure, the Laplace transform is a great way to simplify it, which is usually your first step in solving differential equations. However, the type of differential equations that the Laplace transform is meant to solve are in real space. They describe real systems. 
if we find their solutions and try and plot them over a real space, it should only be returning real numbers. So what gives? Why would you want to choose the Laplace transform, an inherently complex valued transform, and try to use it to solve real valued equations? So let's try a little example. This is a good example of a differential equation that you would normally plug into the Laplace transform to solve. It has completely real valued solutions, all that. If we were to plot the Laplace magnitude, we see two peaks. If we plot a few more of these equations that have similar form, we notice the same thing. On top of this, these peaks always have a form of symmetry. They always sit equidistant from the imaginary axis. In other words, their rotational frequencies are opposites, while their exponential frequencies are the same. Now here's where things get weird. If you were to computationally find the solution to these differential equations, meaning you're using a computer to iteratively find a set of x and y values that would satisfy this equation, you would end up with a totally real solution. However, if you try to solve these equations using other methods like the Ansatz method, which you can actually do on paper, you end up with something really cool. Even though the solutions of these equations are entirely real valued, the solution actually begins as a combination of these complex spirals, and is usually recombined into a completely real valued function using a formula. Although the solutions to these equations are real, their original form, before being simplified, is composed of complex functions. These solutions are not only sums of complex spiral functions, but are sums where these spirals have a form of symmetry, and due to the symmetry, all the imaginary parts cancel out. Instead of plotting the solutions themselves here, I'm going to plot the spiral components themselves and then begin to zoom out, because it's actually a really cool illustration of exactly why the spirals are even a factor here. What these equations are actually trying to model is a number which is sort of connected to zero by a sort of spring force. It'll oscillate around zero with the amplitude exponentially decreasing until it eventually approaches zero in the limit. And if you remember back, our spirals are very similar. They're an oscillating function whose amplitude is modulated by an exponential. Although these solutions and spirals are so wildly different on paper, they're both just different forms of the same thing, which are complex exponentials. The solutions are merely just combinations of spirals that obey a certain form of symmetry, which allows the imaginary components to cancel out, while still capturing the oscillatory and decaying nature of the spirals themselves. They're perfectly balanced along this line, from being totally unrealistic to being entirely real-valued and incredibly accurate descriptions of physical systems. And this is the core of the Laplace transform. It was originally invented just as a tool to simplify differential equations. There wasn't really anything deeper, it just existed because it works, trial and error style. It's a complex machine that was built specifically to handle real things. The Laplace transform inherently deals with spirals, and even though it acts primarily in the complex plane, it's able to capture part of that spiral behavior in our equations. And in this vein, it becomes not an arbitrary choice for simplifying them, but an obvious one.